Well, my message today is entitled, Perception versus Reality. Now, Webster's Dictionary describes the word perception as an awareness of the elements of environment through physical sensation interpreted in the light of experience. Which means our perception is based upon what's going on around us. The five senses, what we hear, see, smell, taste, and feel. In light of our past experiences. So that's what we, our perception of a situation, perception of our life, perception of the world, sometimes even our perception of God. But reality, Webster's describes reality as the totality of real things and events, something that is neither derivative nor dependent, but exists necessarily. The word reality, the root word of reality is real. What is real? The, the root word of perception is to perceive. I can perceive something, but just because I perceive it a certain way doesn't mean that's what's real. In 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 12, the Apostle Paul said this, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I am known. And what Paul is saying is right now, as we're here on the planet Earth, we see, especially God, the spiritual things, even the physical things around us, we see through a glass darkly. Have you ever stood on one side of a glass black wall and seen somebody on the other side? You can perceive that there's somebody there. And you can perceive it's a human and not an animal. And you can perceive if they wave or if they're walking. But you sometimes don't know, is it a man or a woman? What color is their hair? Um, are they smiling? Are they mad? Are they crying? Are they laughing? Because we're seeing through that, we see it, types and shadows, but we see it very darkly, very opaque. But he says, someday we're going to know face to face. One of my favorite scriptures is in the Beatitude, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Someday as well as I'm known, it says, and we shall um, know even as I am known. And God knows how many hairs are on my head. And I know what you're thinking. Some people he has to count more than others. But you know what? Those hair follicles are still in there. They're just right now not growing hair. He knows every whisker on my gray old beard. He knows my fingerprints. He knows every tear I've ever cried and he's caught them in a bottle and numbered them all. And he knows why every single one of those tears are cried. He knows your DNA strand, which is different from everybody else who's ever lived. That's how well he knows you. And someday we will understand and know that well. Now, in the world that we're living in now, our perception of reality is kind of hazy and we have limited vision in Isaiah 55 verse 9 it says for as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts as high as the heavens are from us let me ask you a question do you think Pluto's pretty far away from the planet earth well, that's just it's just a blip compared to how far we are from heaven where God lives. Because Isaiah said he measures the span, he measures the width of the universe, which science says is 150 billion light years. He measures it with the span of his hand. From here to here, he says, yep, physical universe is about that big. We're talking about a big God. And he lives that far away from us. He says, my ways of doing things are that far away from your ways and my thoughts, the way I think about things, is that far away from the way you think. Now, I won't go into all this because it's a sermon within itself, but when we're born again and we have God's Spirit living inside us, we get glimpses of the way He thinks. But He says, basically He's saying, I look at things differently. Have you ever been in an airplane? Like, let's say you're in a, a big airline or you're 40,000 feet above the, of the earth. You're above the clouds. All you can see is just white, fluffy clouds 
nice blue sky above you. And as you start to break through those clouds, you see there's the earth. You can see a long distance. And you can see farmland and you can see cities. And as you start to come down, you start to see the tops of buildings. And then you get down closer as you're starting to land. And then you can see, oh yeah, there's a, there's a building and there's the Renaissance Center and there's the Fisher Building. And you're starting to get closer. And then next thing you know, your wheels are touching and you're on the ground and you're looking level at everything. Well, from God's point of view, He's got that bird's eye point of view where He can see everything all at once. We're down here in the middle of it just looking straight around. Now, I've told you, I've given you this example many times before, but it's applicable here. If you took a thick fog, a thick, dense fog that crippled an entire city block, and you reduced it to a liquid, it's nothing more than an eight ounce glass of water. But that eight ounce glass of water, when it turns into a gaseous form, becomes a very thick fog. And so many times our perception of events and things going on in the world, things going on in our lives, it just looks like a thick fog. I can't see my way out. I can't even turn around the corner. I don't even know what's, I don't know if the traffic light's there and what color it is. But when it's reduced to an eight ounce glass of water, say, yeah, I can drive everywhere. I can go wherever I want. And that's what our perception can be like sometimes. You know, I keep hearing this concept where you think of the game of chess. And they keep saying, oh, well, so-and-so, he's such a, a genius or he's such a chess master. He can play two or three levels of chess at one time. You know, I've seen pictures, I'm sure you have too, of people that are like in a park and they got all these tables stretched out with like 10 or 12 different chess games going on and there's a person sitting behind it and this one person will walk up and down and say all right pawn over here rook over here knight over here checkmate over here and you say, wow what a genius how could they do that and some people they have them in different levels he can do seven or eight or nine levels of chess at the same time wow what a genius just imagine, right now they tell us there's 8.5 billion people in the world. God's playing 8.5 billion levels of chess because He knows every single person. He knows everything about you. How many hairs on your head, your DNA strand, your fingerprints, all at the same time. And that's nothing. Because in the spirit realm, He's got fallen angels, godly angels, principalities, spiritual wickedness, powers. And then, in the heaven that He lives, which we can't even comprehend what's up there, He's running that as well. So talk about a genius. And He knows it all. And His ways are above our ways. And He knows what is real. We see just glimpses. We see through a glass darkly. And when we are in the midst of a situation, we say, oh no, there's no hope. It's, I'm never going to make it through. You turn on the news, oh, the, the end is near. We're all going to die. Go hide in your basement with a machine gun. And we just get so afraid because we're seeing through that fog. So my message today is perception versus reality. And I want to give you a couple examples. Maybe you better explain what I'm referring to. Take this man named Adam. I think I even referred to this a little bit last week. But Adam is who God loves. So in comes Satan, and he says, Ah, I'm playing chess with God. Now God loves this guy named Adam, and I know he hates sin because I sinned, and he's pretty ticked off right now. So if I can take the thing that God hates, which is sin, and put it in the thing that God loves, which is man, the perception is checkmate, the devil won. And guess what? He did that. He convinced Adam to sin. So now sin is inside Adam, who God loves. And the devil looks at uh, God and says, checkmate. But is that the end of the story? Is that the reality? In Genesis 3.15, God says this, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So what he's saying is, 
You think you won because of that? You think God didn't know this was going to happen? Before he spoke the universe into existence and said, let there be light, he knew Adam was going to fall. Well, then why did he let it happen? I don't know. Someday I'll have to ask him. But I know there's a reason. But he wasn't taken by surprise. He said, all right, Satan, you think you can say checkmate to me? He says, I'm going to put enmity, which means a struggle, a war, between you and everything you're doing and this woman's offspring, all the, the human beings that come from Adam and Eve's loins. And you're going to bite his heel. Well, he did you know, play the part of getting Jesus crucified. But was that the end of the story? Of course not. But Jesus crushed his head. When he rose from the dead, Satan is totally, utterly destroyed. So guess what? The reality is, God wins. And as we go along, I'll just give you a little tip. God always wins. He always wins. Because he's God. Alright, let's look at this guy named Moses. I mean, Moses lived a very interesting life. But at a certain time in his life, this bush catches on fire and it doesn't get consumed and says, Hey, yo, Mo, you got to go back. You got to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. So, long story short, he goes back. Now, he goes to the most powerful man in the civilized earth and tells him, Isn't it interesting? He says, Let my people go. He's, he's joining himself with the, the nation of Israel where he was raised in the palace. He knew Pharaoh. Chance, some say, chances are, he would have eventually been the Pharaoh of Egypt. But he's now not, he's not joining himself with the lineage of the Egyptians. He's saying, my people, which is Israel. And God says, let my people go. And Moses says, and I'm one of them. So, after ten plagues, they, they get out of there, they leave, and what a lot of archaeologists believe, a certain part of the Red Sea, if you could take away all the water, the bed of the Red Sea, there's a certain part where it rises up, and it's like about, I don't know, maybe the width of a football field, 100 yards wide, and it rises up and it goes from one end of the Red Sea to the other, and on either end of that, it just drops down a long depth. So God leads, out of all the places of the Red Sea, He leads Moses and the children of Israel to that part. And there's a shoreline there that would hold, because some people say it could have been anywhere from a million to six million Jews. So He leads them there. But in order to get there, behind them on either side is a mountain. And in the middle is a little pass. Just enough for all these Jews to go through. And then they get lined up there. Well, Pharaoh's ticked off. He says, I'm not going to let them go. And in comes Egypt. And the most powerful army in the world at that time to kill all the Jews. And where are they? Here's the Red Sea. Here's a mountain. Here's a mountain. The only way out is through that pass. And here's coming the Egyptian army. So the perception is dead meat. What are you going to do? Where are you going to go? Are you going to fly away? Are you going to swim across the Red Sea? What are you going to do? There's women and children. So the perception is dead meat. The reality is God puts a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire in that gap so that the Egyptian army can't get to him. And then he brings in a wind and he pulls all that water away. But it says in the book of Exodus that they walked across on dry ground. Now, last time I went swimming, the bed on the bottom of the lake is pretty wet. But that wind not only blew the, the waves to the side, but the wind blew so hard that it, it took all the moisture out of the ground, and they walked across on dry ground. And they got all the way to the other side. And then, pillar of cloud, pillar of fire lifts up, the Egyptians come in, as soon as they're all right in the middle of the Red Sea, the waves come back and drowns them all. Perception is dead meat. Reality is, God wins. What about a guy named Daniel? Now Daniel, 
He was told you can't pray anymore. You only pray to the gods of the Babylonians. And he said, well, I ain't going for that. I only pray to one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you pray, we're throwing you in the lion's den. So he prays. They catch him. Now I'm abbreviating these stories for the lack of time. But they throw him in the lion's den. What's the perception? One man in a den can't get out with a bunch of hungry lions. What's the perception? Dead meat. <laughs> is that the end of the story? The reality is, God says to these lions, here kitty, 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 time for you to take a nap. And they lay down and they go to sleep. And Daniel, who knows how to pray, if ever that man was praying, I'll bet you he was praying right then and there. And he's praying and he's praying. So at the end of the night, when um, the ruler of Babylonian comes in and he says, this guy's still alive. Take him out. He must be serving the true God. And the ones who accuse Daniel, they throw them in the lion's den. And then the lions wake up and say, oh, lunch. <laughs> God wins. What about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm making a statue. Talk about an egotist. I'm making a statue, and I'm going to play this song. When these guys play the song, everyone bows down and worships it. If not, you're thrown in the fiery furnace. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, sorry, can't play that game. We only bow our knee to one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they don't bow. So Nebuchadnezzar gets so mad, he says, you heat up that fire seven times hotter than it's ever been before, and he throws them in there. So what's the perception? Three guys in a furnace seven times hotter than ever before. The perception is dead meat. What's the reality? Nebuchadnezzar's looking in there and he says, wait a minute. He's waiting for their flesh to melt off their bodies. He's waiting for them to start hearing screaming and yelling. And oh, please let us out of here. We'll bow down to anything. But instead he says, hey guys, how many did we throw in that furnace? He said, well, just three. And he says, well, how come I'm seeing four in there? And one of them looks like unto the Son of Man, or the Son of God. Now, how does he know what the Son of God looks like? But when Jesus was in there, that's called a Christophany, or an Epiphany. Jesus existed before he was born through the womb of Mary. You know, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He told John, I am the beginning, I'm the end. The first, the last, the Alpha, the Omega. He's always been around. He appeared to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as the Son of God, so much so that Nebuchadnezzar said, there's something going on here. Get these guys out of here. And when they come out of the furnace, not only are they not burnt, not only are their clothes not singed, they don't even smell like smoke. So when the doors opened up, all those that made the fire so hot the, the vacuum of that flame and that heat sucked all those guys in and just incinerated them just like that. Perception is dead meat. What's the reality? God wins. Now, I could go on and on, but I'll give you one more. A guy named Elijah. He's sick and tired of hearing all these people talk about how Baal is God when he knows he's not. So he says, you know what, let's, let's finally, let's put this to a test. Now, what Jesus said to Satan in the wilderness, because Satan says, why don't you just jump off the top of the temple, and God, just before you hit the ground, God will send in angels to swoop you up, and everyone's going to say, wow, did you see that? And they'll give you a TV ministry. They'll even give you a book deal. You'll have a big mega church." And Jesus says, don't put the Lord thy God to a foolish test. But what Elijah's doing now is not a foolish test. It's something that we all need to do. I'll compare my God with yours. So, they set up the two sacrifices. What's the perception? Boy, Elijah, he just stuck his foot into it. He could come out of this looking like an utter fool, utter failure. If God doesn't do anything, he's going to look like an idiot, and then everyone's going to, and the devil's going to come in and say, oh, yeah. He's the prince and power of the air, you know. He's the one that knocked your power out last week. It wasn't God. And he comes in and he'll say, oh, I'll burn up this sacrifice. Then everyone will say, yeah, see, Baal is the real God. 
Elijah says, I'm trusting in my God and this has got to end. So, perception is he could fail. He could end up looking like an idiot. He could even do damage to the kingdom of God. But what's the reality? God comes in, he says, Satan, you get out of here. And of course, he runs like a scared little coward that he is. And then he takes the flame and he not only sucks up the sacrifice, but all the water around it and all 400 prophets of Baal. And he just sucks them all up and consumes them all. So what's the reality of it? Who wins? God wins. He always wins. All right, let's just talk a little bit about Jesus. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So what? What's the big deal? Well, he lives in Nazareth. And he has a nine-month pregnant uh, woman that he's engaged to. And I've, like I said, I've never been um, pregnant. Never will be. But what I understand is when a woman's near her delivery date, they always say, take her for a long ride on a r bumpy road, and that'll get things all stirred up and bouncing around. Well, can you imagine three or four days on a donkey? She's ready to give birth. And then she has to go there without her mom, without her relatives. And then she gives birth to Jesus in a barn. So, the perception is, man, this is, this is hazardous. This is the Son of God. This is the Savior of the world. And why isn't God leaving him nice and safe with, his, with the family and everybody that Mary needs here in Nazareth but sends him to Bethlehem? Do you think that surprised God? He knew that Satan was stirring up in Herod to cause a census to be taken because he prophesied that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And then, when Jesus is born, Satan stirs up inside Herod to murder all the babies two years old and younger. So what's the perception? Why, oh, Jesus, he was born. That's a miracle in itself. But now he's going to be killed in, in this long-term abortion. But God, what's the reality? God says to Joseph in a dream, you hightail it out of here and go to Egypt. The temptation in the wilderness. Now, Jesus is the Lamb of God. He just got baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. And John says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness and the devil's saying, Oh, Lamb of God, huh? You can't offer a sacrifice of a lamb if it's spotted. So I gotta pull, I gotta huff and puff and try to blow this house down, and I gotta somehow, just like I got sin inside Adam, the first Adam, I gotta somehow try to get sin in Jesus, the second Adam. Because once he's sinned, and once he's spotted, he can no longer be the spotless lamb. He can't be the sacrifice for the world. So he comes at him with his best three temptations. He came after the first Adam for something to eat. But he was living in paradise. As comfortable as could be. And Adam fell for it. Then he comes after the second Adam with something to eat. You know, oh, so you're the son of God? Well, you're hungry, aren't you? Try going 40 days without food. I'll bet you uh, the understatement of all times it says, and he was hungry. Yeah, I'll bet he was hungry. Oh, well, you're the Son of God. Just turn these stones into bread. And Jesus is probably thinking, man, that could be pumpernickel. That one could be rye. That one could be whole wheat. Man, I'm hungry. I could do that. But if he does, he's no longer the spotless lamb. So he said, it is written, it is written, it is written, and the devil has to leave. So what's the result? What's the reality? Jesus stays the spotless lamb. He said at the end of his life, sin has no part in me. And then, he goes to his hometown and he starts his ministry. And he goes into the, the, the synagogue and he reads from the roll, the scroll of Isaiah. And he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me. And he talks about his mission statement. I'm here to heal the brokenhearted, set the captives free. And then he rolls up the scroll and he looks at all these people that he grew up with. Maybe even the rabbi that trained him when he was a child. 
And he says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears, which means I am the Messiah. Now he knew that was going to cause trouble, but he had to say that because it's the truth. Well, these guys got so mad. Who in the world do you think you are? You made a table for me just a couple of years ago. You're just a carpenter telling me you're the son of God. So he runs, or he doesn't run, he walks out of the synagogue and they run after him and they got stones. They're going to stone him to death and push him off a cliff. What's the perception? Man, Jesus, you blew it this time. You're dead meat. How are you going to get away from an angry mob with stones? What's the reality? God makes him disappear in the midst. Now, did he really disappear and become invisible? I don't know. But the end result is he's still living. And then there's the crucifixion. Now, you look at Jesus. If you were there and you didn't know anything that you know now, and you were walking by and you saw this man half naked, hanging on a cross, beaten like just, he looks like a hunk of raw hamburger. A bloody mess. And you'd say, he's the one that's going to save my soul so I can go spend eternity with God? It says he came without comeliness that none should desire to look upon him. We would say, you're crazy. That guy, I don't even want to look at him. It's so hideous. You know, I know it's a very, very hard movie to see, but I love that movie, The Passion of the Christ, because I think even that is less than what he went through. They beat that man. Any other human being would have died just from a scourging because the devil had him in his hands. And he I probably possessed those soldiers to whip him almost to death. So what's the perception? Man, Jesus was a good man. He was a really good teacher. He did a lot of miracles. He said a lot of good things. But you know what? He's dead. That's the perception. What's the reality? Three days later, that stone wasn't rolled away from the tomb. It probably bounced a couple of times. Because those two angels said, get out of here. And they threw that stone across the front entrance of that tomb. And Jesus came out. And he's risen from the dead. What looked like utter failure and defeat became the greatest ultimate victory of all time. And because of that, we can have eternal life. It's a matter of our life that we're living because of this struggle that we're in. It's a matter of dealing with the natural versus the supernatural. So what about us? I've given you a few examples. I could have given you a whole book full of them. But what about us? We face some difficult situations. You know, how am I going to pay this bill? How am I going to get a new car? I don't have enough food. How am I going to pay my electric bill? How am I going to get my electricity back on? All these different problems. Well, remember what Jesus, or what God said in the garden, that Jesus was going to be the one that was going to crush Satan's head, but Satan would bite and wound his heel? Well, we're in this battle, this enmity. In John 10.10 it says this, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that you might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. These two diametrically opposed goals. One wants to steal, kill, and destroy. The other one wants to give you a life and an abundant life. In 1 Peter 5.8 it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Yeah, there is a devil. If you don't believe me, just turn on the news. You can see him working in people's lives every day. The total lawlessness that's taken place today. You can see him. I don't know, how do, where do these incredible evil things come about if there is no devil to inspire all this? And Peter says he's like a roaring lion. He's just looking for who he can devour. But in 2 Timothy, or I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 2.11, Paul says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. He's got devices. He's got plans where he can try to devour us, try to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's got devices, but God doesn't want us to be ignorant of it. And in John 8.44, 
Jesus said this, You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. He's a big, fat liar. He's the perfect creator of false perception that he wants us to believe. Because you see, his devices, there's three devices I want to talk about real briefly here. His devices are to try to steal, kill, and destroy, try to devour us, but to try to stop God's plan being moved and worked through us. You know, I have a friend, uh, Ron Legata, and he, he's a missionary to Venezuela, and he said there was a time in his life where he, he totally walked away from God and he sinned, but he was a pastor of a church, and he broke the heart of his wife, his family, and his congregation, and he left his denomination. And he didn't want to leave God, and he repented, but he knew what was waiting for him here in Michigan. So he ran as far away as he could. He went to Venezuela and became a missionary. And one day he's out in the field working, and he said, the Lord spoke to him and said, you know what, Ron? I can work and use an old man or a young man. I can use a wealthy man or a poor man. I can use an educated man or an uneducated man. But I can't use a discouraged man. And that's what the devil wants to do with his perception, is he's always trying to discourage us. And think of that word, the root word is courage. Courage means having the intestinal fortitude to say, I'm going to move forward and do what I have to do in spite of my fears, in spite of my, you know, wondering, am I, am I doing the right thing? I'm just going to move forward. You know, if you wait until you have no fears and you feel good about everything, You'll never do anything. But courage says, in spite of all that, I'm moving forward. Now the Holy Spirit, He will encourage us. He'll bolster that up in us so that we can stand up against a roaring lion or a thief that wants to steal, kill, and destroy and say, get out of here in the name of Jesus. That takes some courage. But the devil wants to discourage us. He wants to take that away so that we cower down and we're afraid and his number one weapon in trying to discourage us is something called depression. You turn on the news nowadays, you talk to people, people have negative views of what's going on, and rightfully so. And he wants to discourage us, and he wants to depress us. Now the devil can't possess Christians, but he can depress you, oppress you, and repress you. And he will do that. He'll jump on you with all four feet. And he'll do everything he can to try to depress us. Because his goal is to just stop us dead in our tracks. God has a plan for us. There's something he wants to do in us. And if we're discouraged, we're depressed, and we say, no hope. He said, my people perish for a lack of vision. When you can't see where you're supposed to go next, you get discouraged and you perish. In John 18.36, Jesus answered Pilate, and he says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Jesus says, I'm building a kingdom, but it's not of this world. Jesus didn't come in to kick out the Romans and make everybody Jewish. Jesus came to gather followers, like I said earlier, the ecclesia, the called out one, his church, his bride, because he's building a kingdom, but that kingdom's invisible. You can't see it. So, come on, you get kind of goofy here now. What do you mean you can't see it? 2 Corinthians 4.18, Paul says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, that means that there's things that are not seen. The things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are temporal. Perfect example. I want you to all turn around and look back at that fan. It's 
See that fan behind you? How many how many blades are on that fan? Can't tell, can you? You can feel the wind. You can feel the breeze, but you can't tell it. But if you turn that off, it would slow down, and you can tell me there's four blades on that fan. Now, are those four blades disappeared right now? They don't exist? No, our eyes are functioning at a different level than that. We can't pick that up. There's a spirit world around us. It's here. It's more, more real than this. Because the things that are seen are temporal. A hundred years from now, this pulpit won't be here. But the spirit world will be. The reason God is creating an invisible kingdom is because if Jesus would have came in and said, right, Romans, get out of here, and would have beat them all up, he could have brought all the angels from heaven in and throw the Romans out, sit on the throne of David, and said, I'm the new king. That temporal, or that kingdom would be temporal because it's seen. But Jesus is building a kingdom that's eternal, so it can't be seen. And that's what he's doing. But the, the devil is trying to change this perception so that we get discouraged and we won't continue in building this invisible kingdom. You know, when Jesus was here, he did basically two things. He did miracles and he taught. Now the people were all excited about, yeah, we want a miracle. It hurts when I go like this, fix it. And when he healed them, they said, oh, wow, he's great. They get you fed 5,000 people out of nothing. And they said, wow, this guy's got a free lunch. Let's go follow him. But Jesus said, I'm doing that to get your attention. But that's not my purpose. Because all those people that Jesus healed, because he healed multitudes of them, chances are not every single one of them is in his invisible kingdom right now. They got a temporal physical healing. But the other thing he did is he taught. And he says, my words are spirit and their life. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Jesus, in, in the series, the, the Chosen, it's always interesting to me when Jesus is saying, yeah, they're following us, and I didn't even do any miracles here. Other places he did miracles, but they didn't want to follow his teachings. He said, if you hear my words and you obey, you're like a man who's building a house on a rock. The winds and the rains are going to beat against it, but your house will stand. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to build an invisible kingdom in us and use us to build more people in his invisible kingdom. But another device that the devil will use is depicted in this. I've got to ask you a question. Remember the man who was crippled at the pool of Siloam? And he believed that when the water troubled, the first one to jump in got healed. Well, Jesus came along and he healed that man without taking him in the water. And again, in the shows, and I love that scene where Jesus is looking at that crippled man and he says, look at me. All you need is me. And by the way, that's all we need. All you need is Jesus because he's got everything. But that man that got healed at the pool of Siloam, was he more important than any of the other crippled people that Jesus healed? Well, how come he's mentioned in the book? It doesn't seem fair. Are you in the Bible? Is your name mentioned in the Bible? Mine is. David's in there. And not me. I don't think he's talking about me. I, I'm not certainly not King David. And Michael's in there, the Archangel Michael, David Michael, but I'm not no Archangel. Well, then aren't you important? Because you're not listed in the book. In reality, I'll give you a little side note here. Every single one of us is in his book. Because remember when Jesus rose from the dead and he appeared in the upper room and Thomas came to him? And he says, I believe, Lord. And Jesus says, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who have never seen but believe still. And that's us. I've never seen Jesus, but I believe He's the Son of God as much as Thomas did. So I'm in the book. I'm one of those that's blessed who's never seen but believe still. And so are you. But the point I'm trying to get is what the devil will come and do and say, you're not as famous as so-and-so. 
You're not as rich as them. You're not as handsome, not as beautiful. Your ministry's not as big. Your, your collection of stuff isn't as much. So oh, I don't think you're that important. Anything he can do to get us discouraged and get us depressed so that we'll stop moving forward into what he's called us to do. Let me, let me just read this to you. John 21, 25. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Every single person that Jesus healed, every single person that Jesus taught, they have a story that's a book within itself. And if He listed all those, when you read your Bible, it would be like, the Encyclopedia Britannica on steroids. You'd ask, well, here's my Bible. I'm bringing my Bible to church today. You'd never do it. He gave us just a foreshadowing here and there. And little. It's like he zoomed in on certain people and told more about their story than others. So when the devil comes to you and says, oh, you're not as important. Acts 10.34 Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive, that God is no respecter of persons. God doesn't love you more or less than anyone else. I'll be honest with you, okay? I'm going to be painfully honest with you. And maybe it shows a weakness in me, but I honestly, truly wish Jesus loved me more than anyone else. Because I love Him more than anyone else. I love my wife with all my heart. But I love Jesus more than anyone else. And I want Him to love me more than anyone else. But if He did, I'm limiting God. Because God is love. And everyone He made, He loves as much as He loved. He loves us as much as He loves Jesus. So when the devil comes and says, Oh, you're not as important. You're not making a big enough effect in the world. Oh, not everybody on this side of your neighborhood loves you. Oh, you're... you're your son, your brother, your sister, your mom, your boss, somebody doesn't like you. Oh, see, there's, you're doing something wrong. You're not as important. I got three words for you. I you know what they are. Baloney. God loves you and He could not love you anymore. I was listening to a speech that Jim Caviezel did. Uh, my sister-in-law sent it to me on my phone last night. And I'll try to make it brief. But he was talking about when he did that the movie, The Passion of the Christ. He said there's one scene, and he said it's still in the movie, where he was carrying the cross. He said he carried that cross for five weeks. It took to film all that. And he said it weighed 200 pounds. And he said it fell one time, and he got his arm caught underneath, and they twisted it to pull it away, and when they did, they separated his shoulder. And he says, if you watch it, you'll see I fell to my knees and I buried my head in the sand because I never hurt so bad in my life. And the scene where he's being scourged, they had it set up where there was three cameras and there was mirrors in between so you couldn't see all the other cameras. And there was like these steel racks or shelves like on either side. So he said Mel Gibson told the, the um, uh, soldiers to pretend like you're throwing baseballs, you're swinging that whip so hard and they would hit the side of those metal guards and he would act like he's getting hit. But one time, one of the cat of nine tails snuck around that and caught him on the back and when they pulled back it ripped big hunks of flesh off his back and he said, I didn't have to act like I was in pain. And he said when he was hanging on the cross one time, he got struck by lightning. And he says, this is, this is one of the most powerful things I ever heard anyone say. I'll never forget this. He said, a friend came to him and said, what was it like to play Jesus? And he said, I didn't play Jesus. He played me. He used me as a vessel. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's using us as a vessel. Yeah. And when you think of what He went through for you, I mean, every evangelist and preacher in, in the world says, if you were the only one on earth, Jesus would have died for you. And we go, yeah, 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 sure. But that is true. So when the devil comes to you and says, oh, you're not as important. 
you're not rich enough, famous enough, strong enough, healthy enough, uh, well, or knowledgeable enough, not anything enough. You say, no, I'm not. But I love him enough, and he loves me enough, and he's playing me. He's just using me as an empty vessel. And then, one more thing I want to talk about that the devil will use as a device to try to stop us dead in our tracks of what he's called us to do. And I call it the difference between instant versus incremental miracles. Now we all love instantaneous miracles. Oh God, heal me. And all of a sudden you're healed. We love that. And he does that from time to time. He's still a miracle working God. But you know how He does the majority of the miracles in our lives? Incrementally. Mm -hmm. Little bits and pieces that we barely even notice. I mean, what if, what if you could talk to Moses when he's halfway through the Red Sea? I'll bet you the devil was saying to him, Hey, yo, Mo, why are you nuts? God led you here. And he's going to kill you, let you get killed by the Egyptians. So that's not bad enough. He's going to bring you in the middle of the Red Sea. And then, I mean, he's looking at these powerful, powerful towers of water. You're going to get drowned. He's going to drown you. What are you doing, you crazy idiot? If the devil comes to you in the middle of your miracle and says, God's never going to heal you. He's never going to help you. He's never going to bring in the finances. He's never going to bring a friend to you. He's never going to give you that answer that you want. He's never going to use you. And you could just say, yeah, you're right. I guess I better quit and turn around and go back and let the Egyptians kill me. God's doing things incrementally. All I can tell you is 46 years ago, God came to this 22-year-old kid who was the worst mess you ever saw in your life and tapped him on the shoulder and said, Davy boy, today's the day. Follow me. And I've never made good decisions in my life, but that's the best decision I ever made. I said, okay, I will. And for 46 years, I've followed him. And 40 of those years, I've been with Bobette. So if you don't believe me, ask her. It ain't been easy, and I've never been perfect. Never have been, never will be till I see Jesus. But if you compared this 68-year-old man to that 22-year-old man, you'd look and say, wow, what a miracle. What if I would have gave up anywhere along that 46-year period? And you know what? I'm still alive. He ain't done with me yet. And so are you. So don't give up. You don't know what He's got in store for you. And just because you may not be where you want to be or where you're praying God wants is going to take you, don't give up. All the devil's trying to do is stop you dead in your tracks and don't let him do it. There's a saying that I heard a long time ago and I'll never forget it. Don't doubt in the darkness what God has spoken in the light. Mm -hmm. And God speaks to us sometimes when we have our epiphanies. I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm going to take on the world. And then you go out there and you face all the problems of life and it beats you down and it wears you down. And you just say, I must have not heard properly. I give up. I quit. But don't doubt in the darkness. And I'm going to close with Romans 8.37. Nay, in all these things. And how many things? All of, all of all these. these. Everything you're going through. All these things, we are semi kind of going to win a little bit. No. We're conquerors. But not just conquerors. We're more than conquerors. How? Because of my incredible intellect. <laughs> and my charisma and my wisdom and my strength and baloney <laughs> because of Him that loves us. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me and so can you. So remember, God's got a plan for you. And the devil's going to do everything he can to steal it from you. Don't fall prey to the perception. Now, we should watch the news and see what's going on. But remember, it's just a bunch of human beings like us that they don't know. They're coming up with their own theories and their own perception of what's going to happen. If I were to listen to every time they said, oh, whoa, the end is near, 
you know, how many times do they say we're going to have an economic crash and we're all going to be living in cardboard boxes? How many times have I heard that? And here I am. God, God helped us live through the worst pandemic since smallpox in the 1800s. We made it through. We're here. We're alive. God's not done with us. Don't fall prey to the perception. The reality is we're not just totally dependent upon the natural. We serve a God of the supernatural. And don't ever forget that. And we're going to have communion here. And as we do, why don't you take that cup and that bread, take it back to your seat and sit down and just meditate on it for a moment. And we're all going to partake together. But Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And what I think we should remember all the things He's seen us through in our lives. How many times in your life did you think, that's it, it's over with, dead meat, there's no hope. But you made it through. Well, God can do it again, and He will.